We have a wonderful mom. Her love for her family and for the Lord is very strong. And we, Sarah and I, are a result of that love and we reap the benefits of it every day. Having a loving, servant-hearted mom who prayed with us at bedtime and who attended church with us prepared our hearts to hear and receive the gospel. As a child, I remember thinking my mom was strong, smart, patient, capable, selfless, loving, good at literally everything, patient, talented, fun and creative, supportive, hardworking and available to us. She is an amazing mom and when I had my first child I thought of her often and wanted to be just like her. I know I speak for both Laura and I when I say how much it meant to us when mom would come stay with us after we had our babies. She would cook amazing meals and um, do our laundry and be the support that she always has been for us. She's always put her love into action by being intentional to make memories and build relationships. She has our entire family every Sunday for lunch and she and dad take us on a very nice vacation in the summers just to make memories. She also dedicated one of her gardens to each of the grandkids and made a bronze, had a bronze sign made for, with their names on it, and it means the world to them. As Laura and I have become moms, she wisely guides us with um, counsel to not let our emotions cloud our decisions, but to stay level-headed and focused on being godly wives and moms. She gives us more love and support than we could ever ask for. We love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Well, good morning, Ankeny Free Church. My name is Matthew. We're so excited that you're joining with us in worship this morning for this uh, beautiful Mother's Day Sunday. So just a few announcements to kick things off here. Uh, we are calling all seniors. JD is wanting information for any senior graduating high school this year. Uh, we want to know what high school you're graduating from. We need a picture of you, uh, future plans. You can send that to uh, JD at AnkenyFree.org. We really want to celebrate all of our seniors. We don't want to miss anybody. So make sure you get that information in to JD as soon as possible. Also want to mention online giving. Uh, again, a safe and secure way to give, especially during these times. So you can go to AnkenyFree.org slash give and you will see a drop down menu there. You can give to our regular weekly offering. You can also give to our benevolence offering, which is a special offering uh, for those in our congregation and beyond uh, who are in need of help during this time. Also want to mention if you guys are in need of prayer or practical help during these times, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can email us anytime, office at ankenyfree.org, and we're happy to pray for you and to answer any of those other requests. You can also reach out to Stacia Weber, uh, who's heading up a lot of our care and response right now during this time. A special thank you to all of our moms out there on this Mother's Day. What a blessing you are uh, to our church, to your families, to your children. Um, and I want to encourage you guys to stick around after the message today, after the final worship song. Uh, there will be some more Mother's Day tributes from some of our people, some of our children. It'll be a, a special time, so stick around for that. Please join us now as we transition into a time of worshiping our Lord together. Good morning, Ankeny Free Church, and welcome to our worship service this morning. I'm Kevin, and I'm here with Laura, Clark, Dave, and Kyle. We invite you to join along with us as we lift up our hearts and our voices and worship this morning to our God who restores and rescues us no matter the circumstances. So join with us and let's sing together this morning. Yeah. 
In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. Gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. we we'll gather together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you lifted on your wings. The world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come Gather together to lift up your name To call on our Savior, to fall on your grace Hear the joyful sound of our offering As your saints bow down, as your people sing We will rise with you lifted on your wings the world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name, morning joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that yes the world will see that our God saves our God
Christ, you are my rescue. Jesus, you are my rescue. I give you everything I am. Jesus, you are my rescue. Jesus, you are my rescue. Sing ever blessed, fountain of the joy of living, ocean depths of happy rest. You are the one who saves. You are the one who saves. You are the one whose hands lift us from the grave. You are the light of Free Church. Happy Mother's Day. I wanted to share with you just for a moment about what might be the most annoying mother in the Bible. You know who she is? I want to suggest to you that it just might be the Proverbs 31 mother. Not that she couldn't be in some ways inspiring, but I mean, look at her. She's perfect. She, she gets up while it's dark. She, she makes breakfast for everybody. Matter of fact, she doesn't just make breakfast. She grows the breakfast. She's got a big garden and all the clothes the kids and the husband's wearing. And she made them the, the bedding. She made that. Matter of fact, she's got a side business too to make some extra money for the family. She's perfect. Is that inspiring? To a lot of us, it's kind of deflating because I'm not that person. And there's actually a Proverbs 31 man in the Bible. Over in Philippians chapter 3, Paul said, Look at me. I'm of Israel. I was circumcised on the, the correct day. I'm, matter of fact, from the, the, one of the best tribes, Benjamin. And if you look at my works, blameless. But Paul took it a little bit further. And Paul said, You know what? All of that. All of that is, is, is trash, is rubbish, is, is worthless compared to the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ. To, to be found in him and his righteousness. My friends, the gospel today is not to be a Proverbs 31 mother. No. Because that in and of itself is empty. The gospel is that Jesus, he lived that life that is eternally perfect. And he says, you come to me with all of your brokenness and your failures and your, I can't be a Proverbs 31 mother. And let me give you my perfections. You be clothed in me and I will give you true eternal perfection. My friends, that's grace. That's amazing grace. i 
scattered, then mercy gathered, mended and whole, empty handed, but not forsaken. I've been set free, I've been set free. Sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Oh, I can see you now. Oh, I can see. I can see the love in your eyes.
Hey, Ankeny Free Church, Todd here. Great to have you with us this morning. I, I have a few things. I think oftentimes we wonder, what is the Lord doing in our midst? Um, oftentimes we get to be able to share that on a Sunday morning. Maybe we know it informally through other things. Here we're all just kind of cooped up. And so I wanted to take a moment just to give you a, a small glimpse of some of the things the Lord is doing. You, you obviously are able to see some of the online things that we have going on, which um, are very, very encouraging. Um, there's some really neat stuff. Uh, again, I point back to, to JD's youth group this past uh, week that was uh, particularly uh, funny, insightful. A lot, of, a lot of good work went into that. And a lot of you have commented on that. But there's other things that are behind the scenes, or, or maybe you just are partially aware of. Uh, first of all, we raised over $4,500 for our Kenya Relief Fund. Um, this will go into a, a very desperate situation and, and provide some much needed relief for brothers and sisters in Christ on the other side of the globe. We're also um, helping out with, a, with the guys in a sober living house. They, they've come together to try and really orient themselves around sober living and a real infusion of the Lord and his work is going into that house as well. Um, but they're, they're really cooped up. And with these COVID restrictions, it, it is particularly hard. And so we've been partnering um, with them in, in order to be able to, to help them in, in some of their needs. Uh, we've addressed a lot of needs within our own church family and a lot of needs, even from people outside our church family. We've been able to, to navigate that as well. Um, I've noticed that there's a lot of stories of people that are reaching out to their neighbors, kind of in their own initiatives. And, and I'm very proud of them for those encouragements, whether it was a, an Easter story on their Facebook um, on their Facebook neighborhood Facebook page, or something um, like uh, like giving out gifts or things, or just being a blessing there in your neighborhood. That is great. And and one of the big things is just the work the Lord has done. Our online family is now bigger. We, we've we've had people now participate. Some of you that, that don't normally participate with us on a Sunday morning, and now you're a part of this. And we just we just thank God for the things that He's doing. We'd like to give regular updates on some of that. And there's some other things that I'm not quite in a position to share just yet, but, uh, but we are excited about that as well. Before we begin, I'm sure one of the big questions you have is, so when are we gathering together? Well, we will need at least one more week together um, online before we can gather together. Now, I don't know what that means beyond that. Like I said, one of the things that we have as a church that is a real asset is our agility and flexibility. And with every week, new and different requirements coming out, most of which we don't really expect, um, that creates some difficulty. And so we want to be able to, when we do gather together, to gather together in a way that is really helpful for us and uh, would be encouraging for everyone that was able to do that. So we're working hard. Um, we have uh, a good kind of idea of a plan that's going to go into place, um, but be on the lookout for updates as to when that date will actually be, but it won't be the 17th. Well, today is Mother's Day. And if you haven't gotten anything for your mom by now, well, I don't know what to say. I mean, you can take her out to eat for Labor Day. Hopefully. You can just give her a good Zoom call. Mom would love that. Moms, they are important. I think about my own mom, the sacrifices she made for me and for my sister, the long drives to our events, making sure that we had great experiences growing up, helping us as grandchildren came into the picture. She is smart, fun, adventurous, has a heart for our Lord. She's generous and eager to help. The massive amount of food that is always accompanying our visits is symbolic of the care and desire to make sure those she loves are provided for. Her role in our lives continues to be great. Everyone has a mom, and many take on mothering roles, biological mothers, foster mothers, adoptive mothers, and even mothers in the Lord. To be a mother involves the care and development of those the Lord has entrusted to you. And for many, this is a joy. For others, there are difficulties. Maybe the difficulty is a child that has extra needs. Maybe the difficulty is in having children. 
Maybe your child is a real jerk to you. Maybe the difficulty is in comparing your mothering skills to those around you. These kind of things can all lead to mommy guilt. Mommy guilt is the feeling of failure that strikes you at the core of who you are. You you see your faults and failures. Mommy guilt, it brings shame. Psychologist Ed Welch says this about shame. Shame is the deep sense that you are unacceptable because of something you did, something done to you, or something associated with you. You feel exposed, humiliated. Or to strengthen the language, you are disgraced because you acted less than human. You were treated less than human. You were associated with something less than human. And there are witnesses. Shame causes you to doubt the goodness of God and the goodness of God in this world. This is the question. How how can there be a world where you have a good, all-powerful God in the existence of evil and suffering? This is a classic question known as the problem of evil. The problem of evil can be a major obstacle for some people. Every religion and culture has a way of dealing with suffering in this world. Islam tells you to obey, and maybe you'll go to paradise. Buddhism says that enlightenment will rescue you from the illusion of evil and suffering. Hinduism says that karma will eventually make sense of the suffering you are facing. The problem of evil is a big one today since our current culture tends to think that life is is all there is and therefore suffering is an ultimate evil with no additional purpose. But we are able to see that in Christ there is not only hope for the future but a, like a consolation for the suffering but an eventual restoration. The, the curse will be undone and we will see life as it should be before the Father in all of his glory. And, and since we are fallen beings, we need redemption in the midst of the evil we see around us. We contribute to the problem. Justice, resurrection, renewal, all of these point to some greater purpose that explains the problem of evil. But an intellectual answer doesn't always help when you're the one feeling the pain. My former advisor, Dr. Feinberg, specialized in giving theological insight to the problem of evil. Then they discovered that his wife has Huntington's disease, a fatal genetic disorder that causes neurological breakdown. It affects you mentally and physical in some very severe ways. So what does this mean for their life together, for her job, for his job? Do they test their kids? How would they advise their kids on having kids of their own? Of course, Dr. Feinberg knew all the right intellectual answers to this problem, but because of the pain and suffering that now affect him, they didn't satisfy as much as he thought. He needed to know that God heard him, that the Lord was with him, and that everything was in the Father's hands. He needed to be reminded that Christ is present with him in his sufferings now. He needed a lament. And that's what we have today. A lament that cries out to the Lord, restore us. If you remember, a lament is a psalm that cries out to the Lord in pain. A a lament is how Christians grieve. A A third of the psalms are laments. The Lord has given us a way to cry out to him in dark times. Now, the book of Psalms is divided into five books. After the main themes of treasuring God's word and trusting in God's king, Psalms 1 and 2, book 1 begins with the distressed king trusting in the Lord. Book 2 takes us deeper into distress, but ultimately points us to the hope found in the messianic king. Now, Psalm 80 is located in the third book of Psalms. Book 3 is the darkest of all the books. 75% of the Psalms in book 3 are laments. Book four shows us God's faithfulness in the past, and book five crescendos to seeing the Lord answer prayer and being worthy of all praise. Now, our psalm, Psalm 80, has some interesting features. Uh, Again, we will most likely have a a tune here now, according to the lilies. Um, Kevin, can we do according to the lilies? Uh, What about according to the Giddeth, Psalm 81? What about according to the 
Mahala Leonoth. Psalm 89. What about according to the Alamoth? Psalm 46. According to the Maharath? Psalm 53. How about according to the dove of the far off terebinths in Psalm 56? How about according to do not destroy Psalm 57? <laughs> Funny. <laughs> well, did we figure out anything for last week's Psalm according to the Jejuthun? Well, I, I don't want to be overly critical. Um, but a little music might be helpful for the background of some of these psalms, especially since it's in there. I, I get it, no sheet music. But it does say to the choir master, and I'm pretty sure that's not me. I'm pretty sure that's not J.D. or Matthew, Judy, or Lori. Well, maybe Carolyn. I mean, she used to be a radio DJ, but I still think it's you. You'll work on it. Fantastic. Well, back to our psalm. There are many elements that take us back to Israel living in Egypt, being delivered from slavery, and being brought to the promised land. There is a common refrain that starts with, restore us, and ends with, let your face shine that we may be saved. It occurs in verse 3, verse 7, and verse 19. But, but each time the name of God expands. In verse 3, it is God. In verse 7, it is God of hosts. And in verse 19, it is Lord God of hosts. Now, I want you to give you a little bit of language insight. What? All right. Kevin says that I should make an L with my hand when I give language insights, so that if you don't want to listen to the language insight, you can fast forward through it like this on my four. Funny, quite the comedian over there. Back to the language insight. The Hebrew word behind restore is the same for turn. This word used in the verse 14 is translated turn. Some of this has to do with it being a third person imperative to God. Third person imperatives are difficult in English. Some examples include, no one move, or someone help, but it can be hard to translate. Now, a couple of the translators leave the word turn in the refrain, like the New Living Translation and the King James Version. Even in the ESV, there's a footnote on the refrain. Uh, but while those efforts make the connection to verse 14, they struggle to capture the intent of what's happening in the refrain. All of this is to say, at the end of verse 13, you should be expecting an additional refrain, but it changes and becomes the final plea for God to restore his relationship with his people in the final stanza. The style of this verse, which is both, both in simple and intricate ways, um, they point us to a single plea for the hurting. Restore us, O God, let your face shine that we may be saved. So with that, let us turn in our Bibles to Psalm. To the choir master, according to the lilies, a testimony of Asaph, a psalm. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who are enthroned above the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? You have fed them with the bread of tears and given them tears to drink in full measure. You make us an object of contention for our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shade, mighty cedars with its branches. It sent out its branches to the sea and its shoots to the river. Why then? Have you broken down its walls so that all who pass by the way pluck its fruit? 
The boar from the forest ravages it. All that move in the field feed on it. Turn again, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. Have regard for this vine, the stock that your right hand planted, and for the son whom you made strong for yourself. They have burned it with fire. They have cut it down. May they perish at the rebuke of your face. But let your hand be on the man of your right hand the son of man, whom you have made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine, that we may be saved. Let us pray. Father, we ask that you would speak to us at this time. We we may not know why, But your words here give us voice so that we might cry out to you. So, Lord, help us to cry out to you. We pray that we would be led by your Spirit. And we ask that this time that you'd speak through me or in spite of me. But we wish to hear your words on our hearts so that we might be changed evermore into Christ's likeness. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. So the big idea of this passage is to restore us. This is the cry of anyone who feels like they lack direction, protection, or care, or even feels like they've lost their relationship with the Lord. We have four different pictures of how God is in this passage. In our first picture, we see, verses 1 through 3, God the shepherd. It's God the shepherd. The shepherd gives direction. Some things to notice. Joseph, um, and with him all of Israel, are being directed by the Lord, here titled the shepherd of Israel. Uh, Note, we also see a reference to the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, The Ark of the Covenant is described in Exodus 25 and 37, and it was uh, the only piece of furniture in the most holy place. Uh, The ark and its contents were kept hidden from view at all times. The ark itself was a wood chest overlaid with pure gold, measuring about three and three quarters feet long, two and a quarter feet wide, and two and a quarter feet high. Um, Contained with it the two stone tablets of the testimony, which are the Ten Commandments. Hebrews 9.4 says that it also contained a golden urn containing the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, the ark was not to be touched by human hands. It had two wooden poles. They were overlaid with gold, and that's what was used to transport it, and they were not removed from the ark. The mercy seat, or the atonement cover, was a solid gold slab that fitted perfectly on top of the ark. And the golden cherubim, now referred to here in our passage, which were hammered out of the same piece of gold, had wings outstretched over the mercy seat, and their faces looked downward in reverent awe. It it was here, from between the cherubim, that God spoke to Moses, the representative of the people of Israel. Ancient iconography often depicts the cherubim as having a a lion-like body, wings, and even a human face, but not found in our scriptures. Our refrain, which is from Numbers chapter 625, is this, the Lord makes his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The idea is that God's shining face it is noting that the Lord sees and gives his favor to you. The picture of the Lord as our shepherd shows his compassion, his care and provision, but especially his direction. Many of you know that we recently raised money to give to our partners in southern Kenya as, as they reach out to the Maasai people. The Maasai are shepherds. They love their cows and goats. Some of the Maasai will, will take money that they earn from other things, such as raising row crops at the end of the year, and instead of putting that money into the bank, they will reinvest it in their herds. One of the biggest outreaches they have done was to put a well in a very desolate place where herdsmen will come to feed their flocks. But the area doesn't have a good water source, so this well becomes a place of outreach. An evangelist will preach, and then they will have flocks come and take their drink. 
They have started a church because of the people trusting in Christ through this outreach. All this is because of a shepherd's care in directing their flock. Likewise, here God is our shepherd. And even in difficult times, times where there isn't much direction, he is here with us. Uh, Turn with me to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 talks about Christ as our shepherd. Starting here in verse 7, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand is not a shepherd. He does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and they know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. We look to our Savior to provide the shepherding direction. And when we don't sense it, we feel lost and hurting. Restore us, O God. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Our second picture of God is as a commander of the armies of heaven, verses 4 through 7. Here we find his protection. Great. (laughs) Some things to notice. The Lord, the God of the hosts, is the name they use to display the might of the Lord. This is the covenant Lord, Yahweh, leading the armies that had power over Egypt. And while there is great might with the Lord, Israel suffers. There are 17 times that the Lord is called the God of hosts in the book of Psalms. Four of them occur in this psalm. The word host is a military term that essentially means army. And while at times this can refer to God's people as his army, it most often refers to the heavenly host of angels. And so here in this section, we have a threefold complaint. First, the psalmist notes that God is angry with their prayers. This gives some indication that Israel has done wrong and is bearing to some degree of punishment or discipline for the Lord, from the Lord. Secondly, they are given sorrows by the Lord. They eat the bread of tears and drink tears in full measure. Lastly, they are mocked by others around them and those that despise them. There is shame and embarrassment. Do you ever feel that God does not have your back? You lift your prayers and nothing happens in return. Here the psalmist is acknowledging their exposed position. I know many who have shed many tears and have felt that there was sorrow for their food. The pain and the difficulty are so much they don't know where to go. Families that have lost children hurt deeply. I sat with an older couple that began to weep over a child that had passed away nearly 50 years ago. There was still that bread of sorrow. We were reminded in this psalm that our only hope is found in the Lord. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Next, we see our third picture of God, the keeper of the vineyard, verses 8 through 13. This picture communicates God's care over his people. Here we see a review of Exodus and the conquest over the promised land. Um, In verse 8, you you have brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. Uh, Things were going well. Israel was a vine, a, a plant that needed careful tending. But in the end, it would spread and produce a fruitful harvest. And they spread over the mountains and have influence over the north of what we would call modern-day Lebanon. Uh, Verse 11 says, It sent out its branches to the sea and shoots out to the river. Israel was reaching out from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates. Uh, They did have success, at least at the beginning. 
but now the wall is broken. Verses 12 through 13. Why then have you broken down its walls so that all who pass along the way pluck its fruit? The boar from the forest ravages it, and all that move in the field feed on it. People can just come in and grab fruit. The boar, a pig, is a very destructive animal. In many states, you can put a wild pig down at any time. There is no season. You can bait them on private land here in Iowa. They are dangerous and destructive and properly prepared. They are absolutely delicious. Am I right? Bacon. Interestingly, as late as the Middle Ages, wild boars were regarded as such a nuisance by farmers in Syria that they preferred them to allow lions to roam the land to control the boar population. A wild boar in a vineyard would undo years of work, not to mention birds and vermin and other wildlife that would come in and pillage the vineyard. A well-maintained vineyard is a symbol of care, steady growth and development, patience. It takes time to get a vineyard up and to get it to where it takes a, and it takes a good deal of effort to sustain it. Sometimes we see evil and suffering and we think, Lord, you seem to be working against your own purposes. And we ask the question, why? Why is this happening? Do you ever feel like a broken wall? Years of work undone, not easily recovered, if anything can be salvaged at all. Do you ever wonder what is the point of it all? Does it seem as though life is fruitless? That all of your years of work, that it's gone? I have a dear friend, not very old, who is close to being with the Father in glory because of brain cancer. He is on fire for Jesus, and he's so fruitful. Uh, Probably one, if not the most, uh, spiritually influential person that the Lord has used in my life. Well, during my years at college, I was mentored by him, and then afterward I joined the staff um, with the campus ministry. Uh, I was with him when our church was first planted, and since then three more churches have been planted across the U.S. Numerous men and women have come to know Christ through this ministry. Uh, So many are dedicated to seeing the gospel go out because of what the Lord has done through this man's life. So why him? Why so soon? In this, all we can do is cry out to the Lord. Restore us, O God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Our final picture is to see God as the fruit as the faithful Father. This shows relationship. As I said earlier, this picture starts with the Lord, with the word turn, the same word group that's used from the word restore. It is the high point of the psalm, the place where we need to look for all our woes is to the Lord, God of hosts. Notice the psalmist isn't only focused on his pain, but on what this means for God. There is a heart that realizes that this is not just about us, but about God's own glory and his name. And here too, there is real repentance and a vow of commitment. Uh, especially we see that in verse 18. Then we shall not turn back from you. Give us life and we will call upon your name. Here we find what is most important is not sin, but it's enjoying the Lord. Our our text also has a big question. Who is this son? Asaph uh, assures us that the father will restore vitality to his favored son in the future, verses 14 through 18. And while Israel is in view, Jesus, the son of man, eventually fulfilled all righteousness for God's people. For example, Matthew 2, 15. One reason New Testament writers called Jesus God's son, the son of man, is to show that he embodies all that Israel was called to be, which makes him the ideal heir of David. And through Jesus, God's son, we can become true sons. Uh, Galatians 4, 4 through 5 say this, but when, the, when the time co- but when the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. How can we know the father? 
by trusting in the Son. It is through Jesus we have forgiveness of the evil we have done. It is through Jesus that we can have the righteousness necessary for the presence of God. It is through Jesus we can have peace and harmony with Lord God of hosts. How do you, do you know Jesus? Are you trusting him now? If so, you have a relationship with the Father, even if the feelings don't match. Maybe there are issues going on, which we'll talk about here in a minute, but that connection is maintained by him, not your hard work. If you don't know the Father, trust him now. If you have or want to trust Jesus, send me a, an email or give me a call, and, and I will help you see what that looks like. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. Well, so what? Well, we here have something for your head, something for your heart, and something for your hands. Something for your head, something to think about. Why do I feel far from God? Well, we need to remember, it's complicated. <laughs> there are many purposes mentioned in the Bible for present suffering. It can be God's justice against evil. It can be God's corrective help for wayward believers. That seems to be what is going on in Psalm 80. It can be because there is simply evil in this world and it spills over, resulting in final judgment and restoration that the Lord is talking about. Suffering can be because uh, this is the means by which you glorify the Father. You become a living example of trust in the face of darkness. While, while the past and future are clear, present suffering can be perplexing. If God is the faithful shepherd, the loving father, and the tender vine dresser, then why is the current discipline so painful? The answer is, is because he rescues straying sheep who would not otherwise be turned from the sin that threatens them, as we now see it in places like 1 Peter 2.25. He disciplines his children in love, as we see it in places like Hebrews 12, and he prunes the vines to bear more fruit, as we see in John 15. We often try to figure out the why behind the pain. Well, we don't get to see that most of the time. We can maybe catch a glimpse of one or two out of the thousands of purposes God has for any situation. But this doesn't mean that we do nothing. Instead, this leads to what we should believe in our heart. And that is, here for our heart, we should treasure who God is. Treasure what he has done. Look to him for salvation. Mother's Day, being a good mom won't save you. We need to repent of thinking that being a good mom, whatever that means, will save you. This will cause you to treasure your performance compared to other moms and make you love your children be based on their performance, maybe in front of other moms as well. Instead, we need to treasure the work of the Lord. Uh, Paul David Tripp, in his book, Parenting, says this. When you think your job is to change your child, you've been given the power to do it, your parenting will tend to be demanding, aggressive, threatening, focused on the rules and punishments. In this kind of parenting, you are working to make your children into something rather than working to help them to seek so see something and seek something. In this, form of parenting, it's all about you and your children, rather than being about an agent of what only God can do in your children. Your hope is that you will exercise the right power at the right time in the right way, so change your children, that will be the end result. That, that process is profoundly different than working to be a useful tool in the hands of God, uh, of glorious, transforming grace, who alone is your hope and the hope of your children. Matthew 6.21 says that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, I, again, to quote Paul David Tripp in that book, so your hope as a parent is not found in your power, your wisdom, character, your experience, your success, but in this one thing alone, the presence of your Lord, the Creator, Savior, Almighty, sovereign king is with you. Let your heart rest. You are not this parenting, you're not parenting this drama alone. 
Your potential is greater than the size of your weakness because the one who is without weakness is with you and he does his best work through those who admit they are weak but in weakness still heed his call. Treasure the Lord. Lastly, for our hands, we need to show kindness and empathy. As a parent, you have some authority. In fact, uh, many in, <laughs> have some authority in other arenas as well, even if it's just simply the authority to post on Facebook. We need to use that responsibility for the glory of God. In that, show kindness and empathy to others. Many people are having a hard time processing this day and age, fear and anger. I have good Christian friends that post the truth of our COVID situation that says something very different than what another Christian friend sees as the truth of the situation. Both are marshalling up their numbers to make an airtight argument. It makes me think of the Mark Twain quote. There are lies and there are, well, I should, I should probably change it because of the kids, right? Let me start again. There, there are lies, there are very bad lies, and then there are statistics. We are ambassadors for this king. And if we don't understand the why of our present pain, even if we don't understand the why of the present pain of our friends, we can still be kind. We can still show empathy as those who do understand suffering. Again, as it regards parenting, Paul Tripp says, the ambassador doesn't have any authority in and of himself. He has authority only because he represents a king who has authority. Here is God's amazing plan. He makes his invisible authority visible by sending visible authority figures as his representatives. This means that every time you exercise your authority in the lives of your children, or for that matter, anyone else, it must be a beautiful picture of the authority of God. In the lives of your children, you, you, are, you are the look of God's face. You are the touch of his hand. You are the tone of his voice. You must never exercise authority in an angry, impatient way. You must never exercise authority in an abusive way. You must never exercise an authority in a selfish way. Why? Because you have been put in your position as a parent to display before your children how beautiful, wise, patient, guiding, protective, rescuing, and forgiving of God's, God's authority really is. Oh, restore us, O oh God, the Lord of hosts. Let your face shine that we may be saved. I'm going to close with a prayer from the Valley of Vision. Let us pray. O Lord, whose power is infinite and wisdom is infallible, order things that they may neither hinder nor discourage us, nor prove obstacles to the progress of your cause. Stand between us in all strife that no evil befall. No sin corrupts our gifts, our zeal, our attainments. May we follow duty and not any foolish device of our own. Permit us not to labor at work which you will not bless, that we may serve you without disgrace or debt. Let us dwell in the most secret place under your shadow, where safe and impenetrable protection from the arrow that flies by day, the pestilence that walks in darkness, the strife of tongues, the malice of ill will, the hurt of unkind talk, the snares of company, the perils of youth, the temptations of middle life, the mournings of middle age, and the fear of death. I am entirely dependent upon you for support, counsel, and consolation. Uphold us by your free spirit, and may we not think it enough to be preserved from falling, but may we always go forward, always abound in the work you give us to do. Strengthen us by your Spirit in our inner life for every purpose of our Christian life. All our jewels we give to the shadow of the safety that is in you. Our name is anew in Christ. 
Our body, soul, talents, character, our success, spouse, children, friends, work, our present, our future, our end. Take them. They are yours. We are yours. Both now and forever. Amen. As I was preparing the songs for worship this morning, I wanted to find a song to close the service that depicts God's wonderful restoration. I found the song, it's probably new to most of us, but it's a powerful reminder of how God can do anything. And the one thing that we continue to see Him do throughout Scripture is to restore. So join me whenever you feel comfortable, and let's declare that there is nothing better than our God. I've searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing nothing is better than you I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. dancing you give beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn mourning to dancing you give beauty for ashes Turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the
turn seas into highway You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highway You're the joyful, selfless, compassionate, humble, faithful, and resilient. She shows the love of Christ as a wife, a mother, a therapist, a neighbor, and much more. She's influenced my walk with the Lord by demonstrating the importance of regularly reading the scripture and never assuming that you've already learned enough to know about God, but that we should continue to dive into scripture uh, and be informed more by the spirit of how we can grow closer to God and know him better. Yeah, my mom means a lot to me. Uh, she's a very loving, caring person. Um, she's quick to go out of her own way to uh, help others and to make them feel better. Uh, she's also a uh, trooper. She is just, she has a very good work ethic um, and she works hard despite the uh, difficulties or obstacles that may be in her way. Um, and that's something that I really respect um, and strive for. And uh, yeah, she's also uh, very quick to encourage us to uh, spend the spend time with the Lord, whether that be in like reading our Bible or prayer, or uh, even after dinner, she's usually the one to initiate uh, devotions when uh, the kids just want to go watch Netflix. Uh, she's the one to initiate devotions and uh, lead us through something and and help us to uh, learn more about the Lord. So yeah, Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Love you. Okay, my name is Jenna Shea and my mom is Julie Shea. Um, I love my mom so much. I love so many different things about my mom. She means immeasurably more than I could ever put into words. Um, I love how she has a crazy laugh just like me. Um, lots of people comment on that. I like how she um, strives to pursue the Lord in literally any and everything that she's doing in life. She's taught me how to um, glorify God um, in my life just by watching her pursue her faith um, and watching her love those around her. Um, I love how servant-hearted she is. I love how hardworking she is. Um, I love how goofy she is. She thinks she's the funniest person in the room. I have failed her and I have messed up in life, but she continues to love me. Um, unconditionally and um yeah i'm just super thankful for the way that god created her and i just love my mom so much she's nice i love her chubby cheeks <laughs> um i just like that i can bond with her oh yeah tickle when she tickles you yeah She's helping me read. Snuggly. That she cares for us. Uh, she's silly. And mommy loves me because she feeds me food. She makes me laugh. She makes everyday memories. She loves me. She cares for me. Brings me apple fritters from Sam's Club. That's really nice. My favorite thing about mom is how empathetic she is. She helps me and then she always, like she has time for me and I like that. Take showers. Mom takes showers. <laughs> so she smells good for you. <laughs> I like that she like cooks everything and does like 85% of the work in the house. I like that she cooks really good food that we can eat. Um, I like that she's always there for me and will put up with me talking about politics and conspiracy <laughs> theories for literally hours. <laughs> uh, 
um, law child, so that's why she loves She's her. our guardian. Um, I think she loves us because of how she cares for us, gives us stuff, spoils us. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Pray. Pray with you? Yeah. Okay. She makes me wash my hands. Washing my clothes every day. That she gives me hugs and kisses. She does nice things for me. Mommy brings me Starburst and she's the best of bringing Starburst. Well, for me, it's trying to act like the parent when they're being bad. Hmm. Scare her? Scare her? Sneak around the house. Just pop out and I will just jump and I will fall down. What's something you do that drives mom crazy? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yell. Too much video game. So fighting and playing too much video games? That's good. Except fighting. Fighting's not good. But playing video games is good? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> make a mess. Don't listen. Um, us making messes and we aren't cleaning them up. Pretty much like 98% <laughs> of the things I do. Um, when we tell her we'll be there in a second and then it takes us an hour to get there. Um, when I don't open my door, my bedroom door when she's trying to have a conversation <laughs> with me. <laughs> she, she messes with her ears like she pulls on them and then like the back. And <laughs> she's just weird. And she lets me touch up too, so that's a weird thing. Yeah, that's <laughs> a weird thing. Hmm. Attack us. Attack you? <laughs> Um, uh, drop stuff all the time. <laughs> she is fine. Um, that was so weird. Her laugh is contagious. I don't know. Mommy doesn't do any funny things. You're the only one who does the funny things. She sings loud songs when we make messes and don't clean up. And she dances. Yeah. <laughs> 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 when she tries to use slang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We love you, Mama. Happy Mother's Day. 